Our text this morning is John's Gospel, chapter 6, and verses 35 to 40. John 6, 35 to 40. The Apostle writes, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing but raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Amen. Well, as we've been learning over the last few weeks, at the beginning of the sixth chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus performed a marvelous miracle. He fed 5,000 men, not including women and children, with just five loaves of bread and two small fish. This miracle was seen by all who were in attendance. And they were so impressed with Jesus that they wanted to make him king by force. That's actually the proof, you know, that all of the people who were there realized what was going on as they were eating this miraculous provision that Jesus makes. I, I still can't even conceive. I think it's beyond our imagination. It's beyond our conception. The way, even the logistics of such a miracle. I was thinking about this just the other day. I mean, unless, unless Jesus was giving them sushi, then the fish that he was multiplying was probably also cooked as well. In such a way where the people were able to eat it directly from the disciples' hands as they're going and passing out the fish and the bread to the people. And it's multiplying before their eyes. And so they want to make Jesus king because, of course, he can provide for them. He gives them everything they need. He's able to heal their maladies by miraculous means. He's able to raise the dead. He's able to grow back limbs. Even if they have to fight against the Romans, Jesus can just, well, raise his army back up again if the Romans kill them. This is what they think. Let's just make this man king. Look what he can do. And as we learn, Jesus, of course, since his kingdom is not of this world, and his purpose in his first advent was not to establish a kingdom on this earth, a kind of a messianic political kingdom, he withdrew from the crowd. And later on, he sent his disciples on a boat across the lake. He dismissed the crowd. And then that night, he caught up to the disciples by walking on the water to them. And the next day, the crowd got into boats to find Jesus. And when they found him in Capernaum, he explained to them their motive for doing so. They were following him. They were seeking him, not because they saw the signs of his identity and believed on him as the promised Messiah, but rather because they had a really great meal and they wanted more. They wanted to eat again. And as we learned last week, Jesus told the crowd that they needed to believe in him and that the Father was willing to give them the true bread out of heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And then they said to him, 
really this remarkable thing, especially from people whom Jesus has already uh, uh, indicated to us. And I think later on in the chapter, we'll see that many of his disciples, once he explains to them the nature of his bread that he's giving them, living bread, they say this is a hard teaching, who can hear it? And they walk away from Jesus. And yet... They still cry out to him the same cry that the woman at the well said. These people said, sir, give us this bread. Give us this bread always. The woman at the well said, sir, give me this water. And so we see, that's where we left off last time. We see in verse 35, Jesus then said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, he who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. So these people heard the words about Jesus and the bread of God, which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. They say to him, give us this bread, but they do not believe in him. And our text today in, in verses 35 and onward, we're going to see Jesus' response. He delivers three of the most profound statements that the Apostle John has recorded thus far in his entire gospel up until the sixth chapter. And it's very remarkable. He gives these three words. The first is found in verse 35 where Jesus shows what the bread of God that came down from heaven really is. He says, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. This statement where Jesus says, I am the bread, is the first of seven I am statements, if you don't count the one in John 4 when the woman says, uh, I know that Messiah is coming and when he comes, he will explain all things to us. And Jesus says to her, I who speak to you am he. Without counting that one, there is seven statements in John's gospel where he says, I am. And something else follows that. He says, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the light of the world. I am the gate. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. And I am the way and the truth and the life. And I am the vine. And you are the branches. Seven statements. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 to 14, God had just told Moses to go and tell the Israelites that their deliverance was near. But Moses wondered, how are the people going to believe that God sent me? And then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. That's his name. He is the great I am. And he said, Thus shall, shall you say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. The great I am in Exodus, the one who spoke to Moses out of the burning bush. He is now standing in front of these people. And Jesus says to them, I am the bread of life. I am the bread that has come down from heaven. These I am statements are deliberate on Jesus' part. He wants us, he wants the people's minds to hearken back to that moment, that great moment in Israelite memory, in Israelite history, when God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush and said, I am, I am the bread of life. Why does Jesus say, I am? It's because only God can say that. Only God can say, I am, because he always is. 
He is the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. God always is. I cannot say I am. You know why I can't say that? Because tomorrow I may not be. That's the reason why. My life might be cut off on the way out of here today. I do not know how many days are written down for me in God's book. I do not know. And tomorrow is not promised for me, and it is not promised for you. I can say I was at one time. I cannot say I am, because I'm constantly changing. What I am, even at this moment, is not the same as I am at this moment. My cellular structure has changed in between those three seconds. My thought processes have changed. My Life has changed. I'm on a kind of a linear time. I have a past, a beginning, and then I will have a day of my death, and after that comes the judgment. But at each of those stages, I'm going to change. I'm, I can't say I am. Only Jesus can say I am, because Hebrews 13.8 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. That's the reason why God says, I am. Because he is. He is. He exists always. He is above and outside of time. He is above this creation. He is. And Jesus makes his I am statements so that once again we would see He's the one whom all the prophets foretold in the scriptures. He's the son of God. He came down and invaded this world to redeem us. I am the bread of life. That Jesus himself is the bread of life is such a precious truth. And it is so wonderful just taken by itself. We could consider only this verse alone for our entire time together. Why does Jesus call himself the bread of life? Bread is the most important staple food of human beings. Baked bread is integral to human health with plenty of major nutrients, antioxidants, vitamins. Even after thousands of years, it remains the most regularly consumed food in the world. Annual global wheat production is 700 million tons. That's how much bread is made in the world today. 700 million tons a year. I was just talking with Bill right before the service and I told him as I'm getting older now once you hit 40 it's super hard to lose weight and you know what Bill said to me he said you have to stop eating bread <laughs> <laughs> I can't I can't do it it's essential for me I have to eat it yeah that's right mm. all these components of wheat grain and so on have direct relevance to human nutrition and health they provide nutritional quality, energy, micronutrients, beneficial health effects from whole grain bread and other cereals have been studied by a large number of epidemiological and dietary studies. Most of the results found that consumption of bread is associated with overall heart health and different things. Of course, I'm not advocating somebody eats a specific diet. What I'm saying is this, that there's a reason Jesus calls himself the bread of life. It's because bread is such a staple to us. Bread's one of the most important foodstuffs consumed in the world. It is a fundamental building block of nutrition. <laughs> Jesus even says about it, it's so fundamental to human beings that humans may tend to think that all they need is bread. That's why Jesus says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So then Jesus calling himself living bread takes on great significance it means that he is our sustainer. He is our provider. 
when he gives us functions as food to our souls. We need him. Without him, we do not have life. We do not have life. Even on, I just have to say, even on those who take that kind of keto diet, like there's, there's even some danger if you take that to an extreme level. If you have no carbohydrates in your diet at all, you can like die from that. Bread is necessary. It's necessary for life. That's what Jesus is saying here. Every natural soul since the fall of Adam has been starving because it is born separated from its creator and its sustenance. And a spirit can only be satisfied by real spiritual food, which is something that the world cannot provide. The world cannot provide food for our souls. It claims to be able to provide it. There's even a category of food in segments of the American populace, which is called soul food. Right? You've heard of that, soul food. But that's for the stomach. It's not for the soul. I remember when I was young, there was a series of books that people used to put in their bathrooms. It's called Chicken Soup for the Soul. You remember that? I don't remember anything about it, good, bad, or otherwise. But even that chicken soup for the soul was just a faint imitation. It's not real food for the soul. This is why the Lord inspired Isaiah 55 to be written. If you'd maybe turn in your Bibles there, let's look back to Isaiah chapter 55. I'm just going to read the whole chapter because it's so marvelous, so wonderful. Listen to what the, the Lord says. You know, Isaiah is called the fifth gospel or the Old Testament gospel because of how often and how clearly it points to Jesus Isaiah 55, starting at verse 1. Oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Look at that. Even if you don't have to have money. What, what is offered to you by the Lord, you cannot buy it. You know that? You can't buy it. Simon Magus tried to buy it. And he was condemned by Peter. He said, may your money perish with you for trying to buy the gift of the Holy Spirit. No, no, no. What this is, this gift of God, you cannot buy this. You cannot bring your money to the table. It's a gift from God. Listen to what it says. You who have no money, come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without cost. How do you buy something without money? By faith. By faith. Come buy it by faith. Why do you spend your money for what is not bread? And your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good. And delight yourself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercy shown to David. Behold, I have made him a witness to all the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, even the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. Look at that. A nation which knows you not will run to you because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel. Who's the Holy One of Israel? Not a rhetorical question. You can say it. Jesus. Jesus is the Holy One of Israel. Because Jesus, a nation which knows not God, is going to run to God. I don't know, like America. <laughs> right? You know, we are the far corners of the earth. When Jesus tells the disciples... That they should go into Judea, starting in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. The ends of the earth is talking about Oak Brook, Illinois. We're the ends of the earth. We are. A nation which knows you not will run to you because of Jesus. The living bread. 
Verse 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Oh, you may have had all kinds of unrighteous thoughts. Oh, oh, you may have lived your entire life as an enemy of God. Not knowing the ways of God or the Son of God or what the Son of God has done on the cross to redeem sinners. You may have lived your whole life as an enemy of God. And what does the book of Isaiah say to you right now? This inspired word, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Come by this living bread without money. Just come to him. Come to him. He's willing to give himself to you. He's willing to give you new life. Let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord. And what will happen then? Oh, can the Lord save me? What will happen then? Isaiah tells us he will have compassion on him. To the one who repents and says, Oh Lord, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Have mercy on me. A sinner. The Lord will have compassion on such a person. He will have compassion on him and to our God he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And then... And then listen to what he says about this bread. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there without watering the earth and making it bare and sprout and furnishing seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so will my word be which goes forth from my mouth. My word will be like bread. This is what Isaiah says. It will not return to me empty without accomplishing what I desire, without succeeding in the matter for which I sent it. For you'll go out with joy and be led forth with peace and the mountains and the hills will break forth into shouts of joy before you and all the trees of the field will clap their hands and instead of the thorn bush the cypress will come up and instead of the nettle the myrtle will come up and it will be a memorial to the Lord for an everlasting sign which will not be cut off. That's Isaiah 55. So beautiful. Listen to what he says there. Why are you spending your money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? That is everything outside of this living bread and living water of Christ. Why do you waste your time on lesser things? And you have Jesus. Jesus freely gives himself. This is why he calls himself the living bread. Jesus says in our text, he's the true bread, the giver of life and the giver of sustenance who satisfies and relieves our hungry souls. And how our souls are so naturally hungry, even starving for want of a true object of worship. It was John Owen, the Puritan, who said, our hearts are a factory of idols. Why does he say our hearts are a factory of idols? It's because man was made to worship. We were made with that desire to worship. And if we're not going to worship the true object of worship, the Lord himself, then we will invent objects of worship. This is what Isaiah is saying here. Don't spend your money on things that don't satisfy. Don't worship idols. False gods that can't do anything. We are born starving for a true want, for a want of a true object of worship. Starving for the want of peace. Starving for the lack of love. But Christ is the true bread, the living bread that satisfies our hunger, that satisfies our deepest thirst. See, that spiritual hunger and thirst can only be satiated by a person. Jesus calls himself the living bread because it is an apt scriptural analogy for the one person who is able to fill our need. Christ is him. He's the one person who's able to fill our need. Yet for all that he said 
and all that he did in the sight of all the people. The other Gospels, John doesn't record when Jesus went up on the mountain. And John just records that he asks where are we to buy bread for so many people. Andrew brings over the boy. He multiplies it. Other Gospels say that he was up there on the mountain, both teaching in Mark's Gospel and in Matthew's Gospel, doing many miracles. People were bringing all kinds of sick people to Jesus, and he's healing them before he does this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. So they all see it. Despite the fact that they saw him, despite the fact that they heard his wonderful words of life, they would not believe. He tells them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. That is a great indictment against these folks. They seem to have actually more in common with doubting Judas than doubting Thomas. Okay, Why do I say that? Remember at the end of this gospel in John chapter 20, Thomas would not believe the other disciples when they told him that they had seen Jesus after the crucifixion. Thomas would not believe it. He wanted to see the proof. He said, show me the nail marks in his hands. I'll put my finger in them. Show me the hole in his side where the spear went in. And I'll put my hand in it. Only then will I believe. Jesus then appears. Thomas saw him with his eyes. And he fell at Jesus' feet and he cried, My Lord and my God. What did Jesus say to Thomas then? Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. All right, so that's in John 20, verse 29. Thomas believed when he had seen. We who believe, who are in this room, if indeed you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe in him, there's a great blessing in that. We believe, though we have not seen. Jesus said, blessed are those who have believed and have not seen. We have not seen the risen Lord Jesus. I've never seen him with my eyes. He's in heaven at the right hand of God right now. I believe because of what the scripture says. So there's blessing in that. Thomas believed because he had seen. We here who believe, believe though we have not seen. But the people in our text were neither like Thomas, nor were they like post-apostolic Christians who believed and had not seen. They saw Jesus and they still didn't believe. They saw him and they still didn't. They saw what many kings and righteous men desired to see throughout the ages and did not see. So then they are like so many starving beggars with the solution for their hunger right before their eyes. And they say, we do not want this food. Give us something else. May God prevent anyone here from falling into that sort of sinful unbelief. We have the very word of God explaining the truth of God to us. It's possible to sit under preaching week in and week out to reject it, to reject the word. It's possible. May that never be like us, though. That's the reason why Isaiah says, Today is the day of salvation. Seek him while he may be found. Indeed, it takes God's hand not only to prevent us from falling into that kind of unbelief, but even to draw us to Christ in the first place. Look at verses 37 to 38 of John 6. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. In this marvelous statement, Jesus issues his second profound 
uh, uh, words in these few verses. First, he says, I am the bread of life. Here, he says that he will never cast out anyone who comes to him. All that the Father gives me will come to me. In the coming weeks, Lord willing, I'll, we'll talk more and dive deeper into that. What does it mean? Later on, Jesus is going to say, no one can come to me unless the Father draws him. We'll look at that, um, Lord willing, a couple of weeks from now. But here he says, all that the Father gives me will come to me. They will infallibly come to Jesus. Those who are the elect from the foundation of the world will come to Jesus and be saved. Now, I have to say something here that's really important. Though Jesus says, all whom the Father gives me will come to me, that does not take away our responsibility to preach the gospel. Rather, it magnifies our responsibility to preach the gospel. Because God is sovereign, this is really important. Don't, don't be bogged down in theological terms. Let's worship the Lord with our mind now. God is sovereign not only in the ends of salvation, but also in the means to salvation. He's sovereign in the ends and in the means. What's the means? You and me. You and me. If you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is incumbent upon you to be a witness of him. The Lord calls you to be a witness of his glory, of his work, of his saving grace in your life. He calls you to it. He calls me to it. I've said to you before, God could have chosen in his infinite power to just write the gospel on the clouds so that when anyone looked up, they would see, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He could have written that on the clouds if he wanted to. Of course he could. But he didn't do that. He, in wisdom, in infinite wisdom, chooses broken vessels like us to be the bearers of his good news. He chooses us for that. He calls us to share the gospel. Are we doing that? As I said before, this verse doesn't take away our responsibility when it says all that the Father gives me will come to me. It magnifies our responsibility because we can know for certain that God has people in the world that need to hear the gospel so that they will come to him. And we don't know who they are. We don't know who it is. It's not like the elect have a cross tattooed on their forehead. If they did, well then I suppose I would only preach the gospel to those who had the cross tattoo on their forehead. But they don't. We read in Isaiah 55, his word goes forth and does not return void, but always, always accomplishes the purpose for which he sent it. So that when you speak the word, all you have to do is just speak the word in confidence, knowing that his word goes out through the mouth of his servants. Just write a Bible verse on a napkin the next time you're at a restaurant and leave a nice tip for the waiter. Write a Bible verse on it. You can know for certain that God is going to take that word and he will use it in his purpose, either for the melting of the wax or the hardening of the clay. He will use it. The same sun that melts the wax hardens the clay. He will use it in his purpose. Maybe his purpose is that the person who reads the word will be like, mm, 
this Christian can't didn't know I was serving a Christian and make them angry. And then for even greater glory, 10 years down the way, he ends up saving that person and, and he used you in that work. Maybe that will happen. Maybe the person is being prepared right at this very moment. God is doing an act of preparatory grace inside of a person's heart so that when they hear the word, they suddenly believe it and the Holy Spirit illuminates their mind and heart and takes out the heart of stone and gives a heart of flesh. And the angels rejoice at that. And you will go forth in singing and rejoicing. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And that leads us to the second part of Jesus' statement that the saved are those whom the Father gives to the Son. And that's why Jesus never cast them out. That's the reason why. Jesus promises to never leave us nor forsake us. But why does Jesus never leave us nor forsake us? Why does he not turn his back on the church when so often and so many times in its 2,000 year history it has messed up again and again? Why does Jesus exhibit such long suffering and such patience with Christians? Well, there's a few reasons. Because he says so and he always keeps his word. Because in salvation he vindicates his holy name as well. But here he tells us the reason. It's because God the Father gives the elect to his son. And the son will never reject the father's gift. If you believe in Jesus, you were enabled to believe in Jesus by God. And you were given to Jesus as a gift by God the Father. That's literally what our text says here. All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and I will never cast them out. Because the saved are God's gift to his Son. Isn't that an amazing thing? What a rotten gift I am. <laughs> Honestly, God, God could have chosen a better model than David Lovey. That's for sure. He could have chosen somebody else. I don't know why. I don't know why he chooses whom he chooses. I don't know why. But I can just say thank you, God, for it. We are a gift that God gives to the Son. Therefore, the Son never casts us out. He will in no wise, he says, in no way, in no wise, cast out any who come to him. Because it is the Father's will to elect them and to save them. And Jesus always does his Father's will. His Father's will is that none that he has given to the Son would be lost, but infallibly saved. So that those who well-meaning Christians, though wrong on this area, who say, oh, the elect can be lost. Jesus destroys, demolishes that argument. He demolishes it right here. No one can be plucked out of his hand. All that the Father gives to him will come to him. And he will never cast them out. Look at verses 39 to 40. We'll see the third statement and, and we'll be done. This is the will. This is the will of him who sent me. That of all that he has given to me, I lose nothing. I lose nothing, Jesus says, but I will raise it up on the last day. Just here's another verse. How many, how many verses do we need? I will not lose any person whom the Father gives to me. I will raise them up on the last day. Friend, if you need a verse, a word from God of encouragement, let this be it. He will not lose any. He will raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have, in the present tense, will have eternal life. And I myself will raise him up on the last day. 
This leads, amen. This leads us to the third tremendous and profound statement from Christ in these verses that he will lose none of his saved people, but will raise them up on the last day. This addresses the most pressing question which would arise in the minds of those listening to Christ. He said that he loses none who are given to him by the Father, but, but Christians still die. Christians still die. So what about that? What about the problem of death? Man? Death does separate soul from body. But does it separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? When we die, this world <laughs> loses our presence. But are we ultimately lost? No. For not only is it true that when the believer is absent from the body, they are present with the Lord, but also even our corporal body shall be raised and glorified as well. And in that resurrected state, we will dwell with the Lord forever. Listen, this is a really, really important thing. Physical resurrection is is a fundamental doctrine of Christianity. It is a, an absolutely fundamental doctrine. Christ was raised in his physical body and glorified. We too shall be raised and glorified. And Paul tells us it will be like seed that's planted you do not plant the tree you plant only a seed and then it dies and what comes out of it is something so much more massive and beautiful so unlike what was planted in the ground and so the what is sown is perishable and what is raised is imperishable. What is sown in dishonor is raised in glory. The mortal puts on immortality. The trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised. That's our glorious hope, friends. As believers in Jesus, that's the glorious hope that we have. The hope of physical, actual, bodily resurrection from the dead. The grave is not the final resting place. Someday, all those graves in the backyard of this church are going to burst forth. Every single one of them. Some to glory and others to shame and contempt everlastingly. That's what Daniel tells us. Turn in your Bibles very quickly to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. You know, this is a passage in 1 Thessalonians that um, I call it the funeral passage. Somebody ever calls me up and says, you know, I need you to quickly do a, a funeral service for somebody. Uh, it's like my go-to text, 1 Thessalonians 4. Um, Verses 13 to 18. Because it's so full of hope. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 13. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. That's a euphemism for death that Paul's using there. We don't want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. So let me just pause there and say this. The church in Thessalonica was so sad because people were dying. People were being persecuted, being murdered even for their faith. And they're asking the question, so I mean, like, what happens then? Like, do we become dust and then blow away? Is that what happens? And and like maybe we just go on in an ethereal sense, pie in the sky, by and by when I die, is like a is like a, a spirit strumming on a harp. Is that is that it? Is that what we're talking about here? Listen to what Paul says. I don't want you to be uninformed. Ah, so let me inform you then. I don't want you to be uninformed about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve 
as the rest who have no hope. Because you know what, friends? The world has no hope. When the, their loved ones die, they don't have hope of the resurrection because they don't trust in Christ, the one who was literally, actually, physically raised from the dead. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up Together with them in the Latin, it's the word rapture. Anyone who says, oh, rapture's nowhere in the Bible. Well, that's what caught up is. That's what they're talking about. You might disagree about the timing of it. You might say, oh, it's pre-tribulation, mid-tribulation, post-tribulation. There is no tribulation. Doesn't matter. You can't say it's not there in the text. It's right there. Caught up. It will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we will always be with the Lord. Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. Friends, this should be, if you trust in Jesus Christ, the greatest comfort in the world. And through his death on the cross, your sins are forgiven. By faith in what Christ has done, you are counted as righteous in his sight. We were just looking at that this morning in Sunday school, in Romans chapter 4. Righteousness, which is credited to Abraham by faith. Credited. Logizomai. Credited. Reckoned by God as being righteous. Not because of anything that Abraham did, but because he believed God. Do you believe him? Do you believe him? Do you trust in him? If so, then not only are your sins forgiven, not only are you reconciled to God, not only at one time you were so far from God as the east is from the west, but now have been reunited in fellowship with God. Not only are you made into sons and heirs of the kingdom, but also you have a living hope of the resurrection from the dead. That's the reason, friends, that John Wesley, when the Wesleyan ministers were dying during the Great Awakening, and people came to Wesley and said, the, your people die in a different way. They die joyfully. They die singing hymns. They die without fear. Why is that? And Wesley said, our people die well. And the reason they die well is because they have hope in the resurrection. Amen. That's why. That's why. Peter tells us it's a living hope. The same Peter who denied Christ three times because he was so fearful of death, so fearful afraid that he was going to be crucified next to his master. That same Peter after Pentecost is like a different person. The Holy Spirit indwells him. He witnesses the resurrected Christ. Never again does Peter relapse into that sort of lack of faith. Never again. As he writes 1 Peter, he says we have a, a living hope of the resurrection of the dead. The reason he calls it a living hope because the one who gives us the hope is alive today. It's because he's alive. His tomb is empty. He's not there. Jesus says that he loses nothing. There's not a single believer who has ever died whom God forgets about. The world may forget about the multitudes who have gone before to the realm of the dead. The world forgets about those whom the sea and the earth has swallowed up. I do not know the names of my great-great-grandparents. I don't know their names. I don't. Do you know the names of your great-great-grandparents? The world forgets 
God never forgets. He never forgets. The sea gives up its dead. The earth gives up its dead. The omniscient God has all of his elect's names engraved on the palms of his hands. They are written in the book of life. And Jesus loses none of them, but he raises them up on the last day. Jesus is the bread of life. Amen. He never casts out any who come to him. He raises them up on the last day because it is the Father's good will for him to do so. Notice how the Trinity works in union for the salvation of God's people. It is God the Father's plan. It is God the Son's purchase. It is God the Holy Spirit's application of this redemption to us. I just want to close with the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 50 to 58. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on the immortality. But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then what will come about the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. The work for him is not in vain because he will raise you up at the last day if you just would trust in him. Amen. Let us pray. Oh Lord, thank you so much for these marvelous truths in your word. Thank you for the privilege of giving us your word that we can study it freely here and without fear. Thank you that you preserve us, that you call us. Thank you that you give us the bread of life. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever. This is the hope that you give to us, Lord. I Pray for each person here in this little church now that you would give each, each of us saving faith in you. Help us to trust in you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.